بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم uh, First, uh, welcome everybody. Inshallah, uh, we'll begin. Uh, this will be um, the second in a series of, of um, discussions of uh, the muwaqif of fi ilm al kalam of al iji And um, in our previous session, we uh, heard from Sheikh Hamza Karamali, who did a, um, a comprehensive overview uh, of all the chapters and to give us a sense of uh, what the text is about. Uh, in today's session, we'll do a deeper dive into the first malpif, into the first section of the text. Um, we'll hear from uh, Sheikh Hamza uh, primarily. I'll give a brief uh, comment afterwards, and then we'll uh, turn it to uh, the attendees for a uh, question and answer. Um, I had hoped to post the, the dates for the upcoming uh, sessions in the chat, but for some reason, I'm not able to cut and paste into the chat. So in any case, <clears throat> uh, on our websites and, and social media, you'll find um, the upcoming dates, basically the third Sunday of each month for the next uh, several months up to December, we will have um, sessions on one of the uh, chat main chapters of the Malkuth. Um, and we'll have different speakers, sometimes Sheikh uh, Hamza, sometimes myself, sometimes uh, Sheikh Mustafa Sire, sometimes uh, Sheikh uh, Saf, uh, Chaudhry and uh, Sheikh Omar Qureshi. Um, I hope I haven't left anybody out. Uh, and, and others will be joining us. In any case, uh, thank you for posting that. Um, so in any case, I won't uh, delay any further. I'll pass the mic over to uh, Sheikh Hamza and uh, welcome everybody again. Oh, I'll just uh, bring your attention to the fact that there's a chat and then there's a Q&A box. Um, when we do get to the Q&A, it would be uh, helpful if people put their um, there are questions in the Q and A. So if you look at the probably at the bottom of your screen, um, you'll see to, to the, most likely if they all look the same to the left of share screen, you'll see a chat box um, uh, or icon. But uh, all the way to the right, before the leave button, you should see a Q and A um, uh, icon. So please keep your your questions in the Q and A uh, that you would like to ask uh, Sheikh Hamza, uh, and of course the chat is open as well. All right, I'll pass it on to you. Bismillah. Thank you. So this is the second seminar. In the first uh, seminar, we had a look at the chapters of the Mawakif. And we saw that there's six sections. Each one is a Mawakif. And in this uh, first seminar, I'm going to look at the first one, which talks about the Muqaddimat. The muqaddimat are divided into six sections. And we'll go through each one of them one by one, give an overview of what's happening in each one of them. So the first section of the first mokif is, he says, It's that which must be uh, studied first, mentioned first in every science. What is that? He says, they are six things. Um, later books in the Muslim scholarly tradition, they, they expand these to 10. They're called Al-Mabadi Al-Ashara, the 10 uh, introductory investigations of every science. He mentioned six. You can mention more than 10. The general idea behind these introductory investigations is that in order to learn a science, you have to have a basic understanding of what it is that you're learning. The logicians, they say that when you start to, when you move towards discovering something, when you want new knowledge of something, we're going to see today how that new knowledge comes about in the mind. What process happens in order for it to come about in the mind? And we'll see that the Mutakallimun, they said that you begin with, you take a knowledge that's already there in your mind and you arrange it in a particular way. And when you arrange it in a particular way, then this leads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates after you arrange it in that way, new knowledge. So you take existing knowledge, you arrange it, that leads to new knowledge. You take that knowledge, you arrange it with other knowledge and it that results in new knowledge. 
This process is called inference. But what they say is that in order to get to your goal, in order to get to your new knowledge, you have to have some kind of an idea of it in order for you to go there. So the knowledge of the conclusion is there in your mind in a general sense before you put the premises together to get to the conclusion. There's some direction that you know that you're taking. So this is why they say that when you are studying the science of kalam or the science of logic or the science of uh, biology or the science of physics, then before, in order for you to benefit from it, you need to have a general conception of what it is that you're going to be studying. And then you direct yourself towards that. And now you are purposefully moving forward as you acquire knowledge of that science. And that's why they have these mabadi, these introductory investigations to give you this general conception of the science so that you proceed in, its, in learning it in a uh, methodical way. So the first thing that they mention is the definition. So we're going to look at the definition of kalam, but I'm going to be revisiting this verse again and again during this session. This is, this is a verse from Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that when it said to them, i.e. to the polytheists of Mecca, when it said to them, ittabi'u ma anzal Allah, follow that which Allah has revealed, they say, they say, we will follow that wherein we found our fathers, our ancestors. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَوْ كَانَ آبَاؤُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَهْتَدُونَ Will they do that even though their ancestors, they didn't use their minds and they weren't upon guidance? There's many verses um, in, of this kind in the Quran. And uh, the scholars of Kalam, when they analyze these verses, uh, they, these are the Mufassirun. So the greatest scholars of Kalam are, the Mufassirun are among the greatest scholars of Kalam. So uh, Al-Baydawi, whose tafsir is the most important tafsir in the madrasa tradition was a mutakallim. And he talks about the importance of the science of kalam in his tafsir. And he does kalam in his tafsir. And the, uh, the, the scholars who wrote commentaries on his works, they do kalam in their tafsir because the science of kalam is an aspect of tafsir. It's there in the Quran. So this verse, what is it saying? It's saying that when the Prophet وسلم, he came to the polytheists of Mecca and he said to them, follow the revelation that has come to you from Allah. Now, he didn't just say, follow the revelation that has come to you from Allah. He brought evidence. He brought evidence for the existence of God and he brought evidence for the fact that he is God's messenger. And that's there in the Quran. So the evidence for the existence of God is the universe. There's many verses in the Quran that talk about the universe as signs that are pointing to the existence of God. And the scholars of Tafsir, they explain those verses in terms of contingency. Um, and then, the, uh, including Baydawi and others. Um, and, then the, uh, and then he brought miracles to show that he is a genuine messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You put these two together, he comes to the polytheists and he says, here you go, here's evidence. This is revelation from Allah, follow it. Here's evidence. What do they say? They say, we'll follow what our ancestors did. This is called taqlid. Taqlid means imitation. It means to follow the position of someone else without evidence. And so, and the verse then ends and it says that, will they do that even though their ancestors didn't use their minds to discover the truth rationally? And as a result of that, the choices that they made were not guided choices, were not choices that were moving towards something that would benefit them forever in the afterlife. So this verse, it is, it shows, shows you that the Prophet وسلم, brought rational arguments. And he, he brought rational arguments 
to prove that what he was bringing was true. He brought spiritual exhortation as well, but there was a rational basis. And it's from this verse that the science of Kalam is inspired. And so the definition that you find in the Mawaqif the, that uh, Al-Iji gives, he says that the science of Kalam is, he says, Al-Kalam Ilmun. Ilm here means science. We're going to look at the definition of Ilm. Ilm is used by the scholars in a number of different meanings. One of its meanings is knowledge. Here, it doesn't mean knowledge. Here, it means a science. What's a science? I'm going to show you as we go th through these introductory investigations. So he's saying that the science of Kalam is a science. Ilmun yuqtadaru ma'ahu, through which you gain the ability to yuqtadaru ma'ahu ala isbat al-aqaid al-diniya bi-irad al-hujaji wa daf'i shubah. This science, you gain through this science the ability to prove the truth of religious beliefs, al aqaid al diniya In our last seminar, we saw that the science of Kalam, one of its definitions is it's basically the science of metaphysics, al-ilm al-ilahi ala qanun al-islam, um, according to the measure of Islam. That meaning is there in this definition because what is the mutakallim doing? The mutakallim is taking al-aqaid al diniya He is taking religious beliefs, beliefs in the existence of God, beliefs in the attributes of God, beliefs in the genuine messengerhood of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, beliefs about the, uh, the reality of the, of the afterlife. He is taking these religious beliefs. Where do these religious beliefs come from? They come from the Qur'an. So the mutakallim, he looks at the Qur'an first, he gets the aqaid diniya and then the science of Kalam is a, is a, is a science in which uh, through its study, you are able to is prove the truth. Isbat here means proving the truth, proving the truth of religious beliefs by presenting true arguments, hujaj, and clarifying the fallacies and false arguments that, uh, that are arguments against the truth of what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought. So this is the science of Kalam. And I want you to see that it's a formalization of what was happening in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all of the verses of the kinds that I just mentioned, I showed you from Surah Al-Baqarah, all of them, they're understood by our great Mufassirun, by the Fuqaha, by the Mutakallimun, by the Muhaddithun to be referring to this reality. And so the you see this definition in the Quran. So this is the definition of the science of Kalam. This is what we are trying to do. We're trying to learn how to prove the foundational religious beliefs true using rational argument. And we're not doing this as a, as a intellectual exercise because we're interested in doing philosophy. We're doing this because this is what the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. I'm going to come back to that thought in a second. Um, the, the, uh, the two other things that are mentioned here is subject, mawdu' the mawdu' of the science. And then number five are, they say masail. Masail are uh, the propositions or the questions. So this here, uh, the logicians, the Muslim logicians, they had a theory for, for, of the classification of sciences. Every science consisted of a series of propositions. A proposition is a statement that can be true or false. So when you study any of the, the science of fiqh, for example, the science of sacred law, then you will come across a proposition that resembles this, that to pray dhuhr is obligatory. Now, this proposition, if you, you can abstract it, it has a subject, praying zuhr, and it has a predicate, obli obligation, that it's obligatory. If you take all of the qu questions, all of the propositions of the science of fiqh, you can, you can classify them and you can say that in order for a proposition to be a proposition that belongs to the science of sacred law, the subject of that proposition needs to be a human action. So 
the science of sacred law studies human actions. Praying zuhr, drinking wine is haram. Lying is haram. Um, uh, fasting Ramadan is obligatory. Fasting six days from the months of Shawwal after Ramadan is recommended. Drinking water while you're standing up is offensive. Drinking coffee is permissible. Human actions. So the science of fiqh, the subject, will always be a human action. And we study. So we say in the science of fiqh, we say that the subject of the science of sacred law is human actions. And we study the human actions from a particular perspective. We study them from the perspective of whether they are obligatory or whether they are unlawful or whether they are recommended or offensive or permissible. And there's a couple of other rulings too. So when we understand this, we have an abstract idea of what the propositions of the science of sacred law look like. So, so there's a subject and there's a predicate and the predicate is, it's, it, it's, you can't just say anything about human action. You have to say a particular thing. And when you do that, you define the subject, you define the propositions of the science. So the way that you learn a science, this is in the, in the in traditional Muslim scholarly tradition, is you study a set of propositions. So the first time you study the science of kalam or the science of fiqh or the science of Arabic grammar, here's a proposition from the Arabic gra uh, science of Arabic grammar. The subject of a verb is rafa' inflected, marfu'. In other words, when you, when you say, you say, for example, qama zaydun, zayd stood, the word zayd, is the subject of the verb qama, and it's going to be marfu'. It's going to be inflected into rafa', which, which means it takes a dhamma. So the, uh, so the science of Arabic grammar, similarly, it has propositions, and you, you can see that the first part of the propositions is going to be a word of the, of the Arabic language, a kind of word. And the second one is, the, the predicate is going to be whether it's marfu'. Or majroor or, or majzoom, one of the kinds of inflections, and so on for every science. So the so this is this is the the science of logic was used to carefully classify the propositions of every science. And so what you would do when you begin your education is you you study an introductory text. In an introductory text, you you study a collection of propositions, and your goal is just to understand what they're saying. And then you study an intermediate text and you expand the number of propositions and you start learning about disagreements. And then you study an advanced text and you expand the propositions and you learn how to prove those propositions true. And when someone reaches a level in a science such that they can prove those propositions true, they are now a scholar of that science. That's, that's the ability that's the ability, that's the goal of studying the science. So, uh, so this kind of somebody who's mastered that science, you could, you could, somebody could ask them a question and that proposition is not there explicitly, but because they have the ability to work out the truth and falsehood of propositions, they'll tell you the answer, even though they won't find it, it's not there in a book. So the, um, so this is, so the question is, what kinds of propositions are there in the science of Kalam? And what's the subject matter of these propositions? So here I have three, uh, three propositions that we study in the science of Kalam. Um, the first one is a little bit complicated. It's in the middle, stated necessity. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But let's take the second one. One of the, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the most important propositions in the science of Kalam is al-alamu hadis, the universe began to exist. So here we're studying the universe. Well, I thought the science of Kalam was about God. Why are we looking at the universe? Ah, because in order to know God, you have to reflect on the universe. The universe began to exist. The universe is a contingent thing so one of the definitions of the science of kalam is uh, 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 one of the one of the opinions of the scholars of, of kalam is that the science of kalam it studies contingent things and a couple of other things but it studies contingent things 
from the perspective of how they are evidence for the existence of God. And this explains the, the entire, like most of the muwaqif, <laughs> that's what it's doing. You know, it talks about the uh, objects and their properties and all of these things. This is what it's doing. It's studying contingent things from the perspective that they are evidence for the existence of God. So this is one opinion about the subject matter of the science of Kalam. Now, look at the last proposition here. It's necessary for God to be characterized by volition, irada. So a defining, this is a defining proposition of the science of Kalam because this is how the mutakallimun are distinguished from the falasifa. The falasifa, Ibn Sina and others, they believe that God did not have volition and that the universe came about as a necessary consequence emanation from God himself without him choosing things to be the way that they are. So the mutakallimun, they disagreed. Why? Well, there's two ways to look at why. The first is it goes against the Quran. And the Quran uh, is the foundation of kalam because the mutakallim, he takes aqaid from the, from, from the Quran, then he defends them. So he, but the second is also that it's rationally incorrect. And it just so happens that all of the propositions that are there in the Quran can in fact be demonstrated true by rational argument. So whether you come from here or whether you come from here, you come to the same conclusion. Um, and you can see that. Okay, this, is, this is, and when you, when you do kalam, you, you see that, right? So, so uh, now look at this middle one, right? This middle one. This middle one is talking about uh, modality. So modality, modal logic, is a very important topic of kalam, a topic of logic. And the Muslim uh, logicians and mutakallimun, they have clarity here that modern modal logic logicians, they don't have. It's just a complete mess and um, confusion. So so they have, this is worth studying and inshallah, I think in the future, maybe I'd like to do a seminar on this topic of modality and what it is, because it's related to the argument from contingency, because the argument from contingency is about perceiving a modality. So the, so here it talks about modality. Modality is when you take, you take a proposition, you say God exists, God exists, right? God exists necessarily. Does God exist contingently or does God exist necessarily? Or does God exist actually? These are three different statements. Somebody, so somebody who says God exists can mean one of two things. They can say that, yes, it's true that God exists, but it's a fact. And I know it's true, but he doesn't have to exist. If you say God exists necessarily, it means he must exist. He cannot not exist. The universe exists contingently. So contingency and necessity, these are modal concepts. What is a modal concept? And so this is a um, stated necessity, real necessity. I'm not, so I'm, I'm not going to unpack it in any more. Just, I'll just leave it as this mysterious statement here. And inshallah, we'll return to this at some other point. But for now, I want you to see that this kind of complex statement that is talking about modalities now is related somehow to the science of Kalam. And what you're trying to do in Kalam is basically prove La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. That's what you're trying to prove. But now it's taken you to this very philosophical concept of modality. So, the, so this is why uh, he says, uh, the uh, Al-Iji, he says that the subject, the mawdu'ah, the subject matter of the science of kalam is al-ma'loom. Al-ma'loom. So when you say al-ma'loom, ma'loom means things that are known. The reason why he says ma'loom is because the is to, to include both contingent and necessary things. Al ma'loom, i.e., whether it's necessary or contingent, whether it's God or a or the contingent universe, all of these things, they are the subject matter of kalam. Kalam talks about everything, anything, 
can be the subject matter of kalam, al-ma'loom. But it has to be from a particular haythiya, from a particular perspective. He says, al-ma'loom min haythu yata'allaqu bihi ithbatu al-aqa'id. It's anything, any concept that occurs in the mind, this is the ma'loom, from the perspective of, from the perspective that proving religious beliefs true is connected to it. يَتَعَلَّقُ بِهِ إِثْبَاتُ الْعَقَائِدِ تَعَلُّقًا قَرِيبًا أَوْ بَعِيدًا Sometimes that relation is close, sometimes that relation is far, it's distant. So you'll come to the books of Kalam, you'll come to the Mawaqif, and you'll open it up. And, he, and you'll find that he's talking about the various kinds of properties that the objects in the universe can possess. And he goes, he debates whether the universe is, consists of atoms, discrete particles, or whether it's continuous. And the arguments for this and the arguments for that, and those who say that it's discrete, do these discrete indivisible particles, can they be characterized by color or can they not be characterized by color? All of these are medieval discussions, right? So they don't, uh, they, uh, uh, you know, there's, they, need, they need to be updated, but, uh, but they're there and they seem, it looks like, it looks like what they're doing is they are studying the universe, looks like they're doing science, looks like they're doing falsafa, but what they're actually doing is they're saying this because it has some kind of a distant relationship to proving uh, the religious, the foundational religious beliefs. So you have to, when you look at the science of Kalam, you have to kind of look at everything through this filter. And I'm helping you see that filter in this class by, re by returning repeatedly to this verse of the Quran, which, which you've already seen. Um, and uh, and so we'll we'll return to that inshallah. So this is now he tells you. He, so in this first section, we've seen the definition of kalam. We've seen this what what it why he defines the subject and the propositions of the science of kalam. What's the what's the what's the benefit of studying kalam? He gives many benefits. This is from the actual mawaqif. He says the first benefit is at taraqi min hadid taqlid. The first benefit is to rise from the lowlands of taqlid. Taqlid is imitation. So the mutakallimun, they don't like imitation. They don't like imitation. They say if you adopt a belief, don't adopt it until you have evidence that it's true. Don't imitate. Um, when you go to the science of fiqh, you will see that they do imitation. So they do taqlid. So you do taqlid of Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam, Imam Shafi, but it's not actually, you don't, it's not complete image. It's an evidence-based taqlid. You don't, you can't just follow anyone. So even there, it's based on evidence because complete taqlid would be like you stick your head out the window and you, and you see somebody and you say, hello, what's your name? He says, my name is Zaid, or maybe my name is Joe. You say, hey, Zaid or Joe, how do I pray? And he says, you stand on your head and you wiggle your toes. <laughs> so that's what you do. This is taqlid. Nobody does that. And so when, when, we, when, when we do taqlid of Imam Shafi'i or Imam Abu Hanifa, there's a, there's a rational process that you go through to determine that this person is worthy and acceptable for you to do taqlid of. So the entire, um, entire scholarly enterprise of the Muslim scholarly tradition, it's based on coming out of taqlid of becoming independent, of using your mind, of seeing the conclusion and doing the right thing. Because when you, when you, when, when you, when religion, it becomes something that somebody of authority says, and you have to accept it unquestioningly, this is, this is the beginning of, uh, of religious corruption, right? And it causes problems and I have an interest in the works of the new atheists. I have a, a series, inshallah, there'll be, there'll be a se session on this. And when they, when they describe um, religion gone bad, it's always, this is what happens. And there are many examples of religion gone bad amongst Muslims, amongst Christians, amongst people of all faiths. And Muslims would say that the way out of that is to use your mind and become independent and do what you believe to be right. 
So the Mutakallimun, they are the foremost pro proponents of this. And they say you should study the science of Kanam because you don't want to imitate anybody. You want everything that you believe to be based on evidence. He gives other, uh, other uh, benefits as well. Um, there's a, I, I thought I'd just give you a flavor. I'd pick a couple. So the second one is Hifzu Qawa'id al the third benefit. This is something that people, uh, they can relate to, which is to preserve the foundations of religion. And this is like apologetics, to defend Islam. Um, and, and so this is another benefit of studying the, um, the science of Kanam. The word apologetics, it's, unfortunately, it's taken on a negative meaning. I don't think it's any different from just philosophy because uh, it's just, you're just using your mind to see what's true. And it just happens to be that the conclusions that you come to are conclusions that people of a particular religion hold. And so you should, we should focus on the fact that you used an evidence-based process to get there. And we shouldn't say that just because you came to a religious belief that your conclusion is somehow uh, not worthy of being uh, of being uh, given any consideration, which is um, it's like a, a bias that um, that prevails um, in our modern uh, uh, academic society. So, uh, so this is that's the third benefit. The, the 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 fifth benefit is very 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 interesting. I I'm very this is the fourth one. The fourth one is very interesting. It says a rabi an yubna alayhi alulum sharia. This is really interesting. So he's saying that the science of Kalam, the fourth benefit of Kalam is that the revelatory sciences be built upon it. That the revelatory sciences be built upon it. So science, one of the names of, of the science of Kalam is Usul ad din the foundations of religion. And what it, it's this is this is really this is really it's like the it's an amazing science and it's really sad that it's been neglected in our times because you really can't understand any other science until you understand this science that's why it's called usul ad din so when you let's say for example you study tafsir you're studying the meanings of the quran of the words of the quran what are you studying really you are studying the meanings of the speech of God. That's what you're studying. You are studying the meanings of the speech of God. But what if you don't believe it's the speech of God? Then what are you doing? You're not doing tafsir. You're not doing tafsir. So the, the science of tafsir assumes that you believe that the Quran is the speech of God which assumes that you know the rational argument for the fact that this is genuine revelation that came that was that came to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who is the messenger of god who really exists so if you take that away and you just study the the, the meanings of these arabic letters then you're not doing tafsir and you go down a different path and this is a phenomenon that we see in our times and so it's a there's a um it's and this is like the, you know, it's you know, so it's it's strange that uh, you know in in the in mainstream academic discourse when you're doing a tafsir of the Quran in certain environments you have to suspend the fact that you believe that it's the speech of God in order to be seen as somebody who's not biased. <laughs> okay, so so this is like the mutakallimun would would disagree. And they would say that you you're not even doing tafsir. What about fiqh, right? You're studying fiqh. What are you studying in fiqh? You are studying when you say that the, when you say that it's praying zohar is obligatory, you, what, what are you really saying? You are saying that God with his beginninglessly eternal speech has addressed you and me and every morally responsible uh, human being and commanded them to pray the zohar prayer. That's what it means. So in order for you, in order for you to believe that this statement is true, you have to believe that God exists, that he actually said this, that he 
that the Prophet وسلم, is his messenger because otherwise you can't believe that the Quran is revelation. All of these things are foundation. So, and if these foundations are there, and when they're there, then you're doing fiqh. And the same in all of the revelatory sciences, the study of hadith, so the and so on. So the 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 science of kalam, what it does, it actually revolutionizes the way that you study the revelatory sciences. They take a completely different meaning. And you can you can you can actually what you can do is you can. Uh, when with this, when you look at the the prolegomena of every science and the science of kalam, and you look at the subject and the predicate and the propositions, you can take a statement in the science of the, such as to pray dhuhr is obligatory, and you can prove it through a series of logical propositions that go back to the first principles that I'll show you in in today's seminar, uh, which are like the the non inferential propositions on which the science of kalam is based and 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 when you can and when you when when you're able to so usul is an important science to study to do this but you have to study usul from like a kalami perspective um and 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 when you do that you it's it's just you have a very different idea a very different conception of what it is what it means when you see the statement that's to pray zuhur is obligatory and the the great scholars of the past, the great Ottoman scholars of the past, um, this is what their curriculum enabled them to do. And the great Azhari scholars of the past, this is what their curriculum enabled them to do. And the great scholars from the Farangi Mahal in the Indian subcontinent, this is what their curriculum enabled them to do. And the foundation of it is the science of Kalam. Right. So, and he says at the end, he says that the 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 benefit, the last benefit, he says, zalika kullihi al-fawzu darain. It's to he says the of all of these things of coming out of taqlid, of preserving the religion, and of building all of the revelatory sciences upon the science of kalam. The goal of all of that is to have foes, to have um, success. By having happiness in both lives, in this life and also the next life. So that's uh, that's why. Um, so in other words, seeing this, doing all of these things is an obligation. It's an obligation to come out of taqlid. It's an obligation to preserve the religion. It's an obligation to conceive of the religious sciences in this way. Either it's a personal or a communal obligation. Um, and, and when you fulfill this, you're doing, you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it benefits you forever in the afterlife, but it also leads you to happiness in this life. In this, if, if you believe in God, if you believe in the messenger of Allah, you will be a happier person in this life. And, uh, and he says, that's, that's the greatest, that's the goal. And I think this is important because this is, uh, this is, Kalam is a, it's a it's a, a religious science. Right? So um, so uh, there are other things here, the name and the rank. I'm just going to skip those. Um, I just want to give you an overview of what happens in the science uh, in this first mokif. So we've now done the first uh, section of this first mokif. The first section of this first mokif is on the prolegomena of every science. So we're done with that. What's the second? Second mokif. The second mokif, he starts to define knowledge. If you look at the second and the third and the and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth, all of these things, they are to do with knowledge, with what is knowledge, how does knowledge come about. In modern philosophy, this is a branch of philosophy that's called epistemology. So these are about the epistemology of the mutakallimun. And there's also logic here. So uh, the entire science of logic is summarized in these sections. I'll describe how that happens as I, as I walk through these sections. So the, the introductory mokif, the first mokif, it talks about kalam. That's the first one. And then it talks about logic and epistemology. But it's logic and epistemology for kalam. For kalam. And you have to keep that in mind. Uh, so when you... When you study epistemology in a modern university, um, it's not in the context of proving 
the existence of God and the messengerhood of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's general. It's how, how do you gain all kinds of knowledge? Um, so when, you're, when we're looking over here, there's everything is moved and targeted and fine-tuned and directed towards this goal that he set out when he defined what kalam is and what its subject matter is. And so these are the tools that will enable you to do that. So you have to kind of keep this in mind. This is what philosophers of religion would call like epistemology of religion rather than general epistemology. So he starts off here by talking about the definition of knowledge. But uh, so he, he defines knowledge. Again, I'm going to come back to this verse and I'm going to look at this definition in the context of this verse. So the books of Kalam, uh, they don't actually quote that many verses or hadith, but in reality, they are all written in light of these verses and hadiths. And you see that when you study the other sciences, because if you, you, I, you just saw that the goal of the science of Kalam is to put all other sciences on top of it. So there's a, there's a context of Kalam that you only see when you complete your studies in the traditional madrasa curriculum. So you'll find, so this, this tafsir that I'm giving of this verse is a standard tafsir. It's not a it's not something that I'm imposing upon it. It's a standard tafsir. You'll find in Baydawi, you'll find in Razi, you'll find in, in uh, Abu Sa'ud, you'll find in the, in the great uh, works of tafsir in the madrasa tradition. So this verse, again, so what is it saying? It's saying that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he comes to the polytheists and he says to them, he says to them that follow the revelation that you know is from God and there's evidence and they say we'll do taqlid we'll just imitate our ancestors so so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying follow the revelation that you know is, that you know is from God that you know is from God no no this is knowledge this is why the scholars of kalam are defining knowledge because they want this knowledge it's this knowledge that they're talking about. So when you, when you, uh, so when you're trying to, when somebody is trying to make connections between modern epistemology and what the mutakallimun are saying, you have to kind of filter, you have to filter modern epistemological discussions with the filter of kalam and see whether it relates to it or whether it's irrelevant. And there are many discussions that are just irrelevant. They don't apply. You put those aside. And you focus on the foundational ones that relates to kalam, and then they come into conversation with what the mutakallimun are saying. So this is why he's defining knowledge. So what is, how does he define knowledge? He, this actually, this is a very long section, and he begins by, take, by discussing whether or not knowledge is even definable. And uh, there are a group, there's a group of scholars that said that knowledge is not definable. Uh, because it's basic. Um, and so there's two kinds of concepts. This will come in at the end of today's seminar. There, there's one kind of comp concept that's a composite concept. You take two smaller uh, concepts and you compose them together to make a composite concept. And the process of composition, this is definition. But then there's those basic concepts that you use, the building blocks that you use to compose other concepts. Those building blocks, they cannot be composed of any other, comp, uh, of any other pieces. So they are undefinable. You can't define them. They're known. So there's a group of uh, who said who said that knowledge is like that. And the reason why they did that is because there are, so there's like a dozen, more than a dozen, maybe, I don't know, there's a, many definitions of knowledge. And, um, and all of them, they appear to be circular. So if you try, try to define knowledge without bringing knowledge into it. So, so, so the classical definition of knowledge, is, it's knowing that which is known. <laughs> you can't get any more circular than that. Okay, it's like knowledge is there in the it's the thing that's being defined and it's everywhere in the definition. And, and so, and, and you'll say knowing that which is known, oh, I get it. Why did you get it? You didn't get it because of the definition. You got it because you already knew it even before the definition was there. 
So, uh, so this is, there's a group of scholars who hold this position. There's another group of scholars. They say, I think Juwaini falls here. He says that it's, it's definable. It's, it's comp, it's not basic, but it's really difficult to define. Uh, they say that, so this is, they say there's certain things that you can't like, we kind of know what they are, but they're not basic, but you just, you can't define it. So they, uh, so this is a, um, this is a, you know, what this reveals, it actually reveals a higher level idea is that you don't have to have a clear idea of everything in order to be able to use it and benefit from it. Um, so, uh, uh, so, he, so for example, God, uh, what's the definition of God? Do we know God in, in terms of a clear definition that gives us a complete conception and we can understand the essence of who God is? No. You know certain things about God that allow you to distinguish him from everybody else, but who is he really? You don't understand. So we are, uh, so there's, it's part of our epistemology that we can work with such concepts. And there's a group of mutakallimun who held that, that, that uh, knowledge, it's this kind of a concept. And then there's a group of mutakallimun, they said it can be defined. And I'm gonna give a definition. And this is the definition that they gave. And Adul uh, al-Din al-Iji, he says, this is al-Mukhtar. And so he says, knowledge is a sifa. This is a very interesting definition. And I'm going to point out a number of, of uh, useful things that will help you place um, this and the science of Kalam into context. The first is that this is defining uh, certain knowledge. So knowledge, when we, when we say ilm in English, we often translate it in English as knowledge. It's not an accurate translation because the word ilm is used by the mutakallimun to mean certainty. It's used by the fuqaha and the scholars of usul to mean probabilistic knowledge, not certainty. But in the, in the vocabulary of the mutakallimun, knowledge here is certainty. Because the reason why, it's, it, the reason is that in the verse that I just showed you, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went to the mushrikun when he said to them that you know that this is revelation, revelation from God. What he meant was that you have certainty based on evidence that this is revelation from God. And still, you insist on imitating the way of your ancestors. So, the, so this is the kind of knowledge that's the goal of the scholars of Kalam to arrive at. And so they define knowledge in a way that refers to certain knowledge, certainty. In sacred law, in the details of religious practice, um, whether you should, whether, whether reciting the basmala, bismillahir rahmanir rahim is required in the prayer or not, this is a point of disagreement. This knowledge is not certain knowledge, it's probabilistic knowledge. And so the realm of the science of fiqh, the science of usul, most of the other sciences, the realm of most sciences is the second kind of knowledge, which is called a Um, So in the science of kalam, it's the foundational things on which the entire edifice scholarly edifice of our religion rests these foundational things they're certain they give certainty and 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 kalam in the basic things that it wants to demonstrate it demonstrates certainty so ilm means certain knowledge so over here it says on the definition of knowledge it should you should say something like on the definition of certainty certain knowledge so what is knowledge he says it's a sifa he says it's an attribute. It's an attribute. So it's an attribute. So I have the attribute of knowledge. You have the attribute of knowledge. Um, an inanimate thing like this pen does not have an attribute of knowledge. Does a dog or a horse have an attribute of knowledge? The mutakallimun would say that it doesn't. Right? So the Humans are rational animals. Um, uh, you're thinking Aristotle, but I'm thinking before Aristotle. Like, you know, this is, has religious, the Aristotle wasn't the first one to think about these things. 
but uh, uh, this is uh, this is a religious idea. It's a religious idea that that the thing that distinguishes us from the animal world is the fact that we have knowledge. So human beings, they have this attribute of knowledge. What's an attribute? <laughs> What's an attribute? That will come in the uh, in the fourth or fifth motif, right? Fourth or fifth. So you're going to talk about attributes. But for now, we're just going to kind of wing it and say it's an attribute that you and I possess. And this attribute, so this attribute has a mahal, a site, a locus. So I'm the locus of my attribute of knowledge. You're the locus of your attribute of knowledge. When I have this attribute of knowledge, then it tujib. Tujib literally means necessitate. But over here, it's it's a, the, uh, the commentators, they'll say, Tujibu adatan. Adatan means that everything is contingent. It's a, it leads to, it normally leads to, uh, through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of everything. It normally, when, when someone has this attribute, then normally, regularly, the possession of this attribute is followed by tamyiz. Tujibu li mahalliha tamyizan. Tamyizan bayn al ma'ani. Tamyiz and bayn al ma'ani, it means. So this tamiz, this is how he gets out of the circularity in the definition. All the other definitions that have circularity, they bring ilm. So he gets out of it by saying tamiz. Tamiz is distinction. So I can look and I can say this is tall, this is short, this is black, this is white, this is contingent, this is necessary. There are all of these meanings, ma'ani, and because I have this attribute of knowledge, I can distinguish between these meanings, which happen to be universal concepts. Uh, this, last, this last part of the definition is what shows that this is talking about certain knowledge. It's saying that it, it, it leads to a distinction between meanings you know, and this distinction, لا يحتمل النقيض. The, the contradictory opposite of it is, is, is not possible. Not possible is not a good translation. I'll explain why in a second. But the general idea is that you, it's a, what's here is when I have this attribute, I look at the universe, I come to the conclusion that God exists and this knowledge of the existence of God, which is a tamyiz, is, is a knowledge that I have absolute certainty in. I know that the opposite is not the case. It's absolutely not the case that God does not exist. So, and I have this knowledge. This is ilm. This is ilm, certain knowledge. There's another kind. So this, this definition, it excludes one which is the second thing you see on the list here. Van is probabilistic knowledge. It's when you believe something to be the case, but you're not 100% sure. So it could be you're 90% sure, 10%, it could be something else. If it were something else, it would not be a contradiction. So this is called probabilistic knowledge, confidence. In Kalam, we don't want van, we want el. And the third level is, is shak. Shak is 50-50. This is uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty. You're not, you don't know whether it's, is it this or is it this. You, you, you're, so this is also no good. We want n. And finally, we have something called taqlid. Taqlid is imitation. It's not knowledge. So van and shak and taqlid are not knowledge. So this means that if someone says, believes, that God exists simply out of imitating someone else, they don't have knowledge. They don't have knowledge of the existence of God. They don't have knowledge of the fact that the Prophet وسلم, is God's messenger. When you take something based on authority, you don't have knowledge. You're just accepting something on authority. So we so this is what this is what knowledge is. This is the definition of knowledge, and this is the definition of the attribute. This is the definition of the attribute. And then you can get into the metaphysics of it, that there is an object of knowledge and there's the attribute. And then there's an actual result. There's a change that comes about in the human soul. Uh, and that's when you really know. Um, 
and that will come in a different mokif of the mawaqif. So this is the definition of knowledge. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a discussion here that's very interesting. And it, uh, it basically what uh, this discussion shows, you can find it at the end of this, um, in section two of the, the first mokif. It says that contingency does not negate the possibility of scientific knowledge. I'm saying that. Actually, what it says is, I'll tell you what it says in a second, but the, uh, what they, so everything, we see the universe as being completely and utterly contingent, meaning that everything in the universe could be some other way. Meaning that when I, when somebody, uh, when somebody puts their hand into the fire and is burned by it, and they, and they see that fire burns a hundred times, then it's possible that on the 101st time, it's not going to burn them. So you have the famous um, Hume's problem of induction. And he's saying that because of this, you can never know that, uh, that fire actually burns. A simplified presentation of this thing that led to Kant and set the, uh, set the cycle of Western philosophy, uh, set the wheel of Western philosophy rolling. So, uh, so if you come back right to the beginning, the Mutakallimun said that the fact that something is contingent does not negate the possibility of scientific knowledge. So there, there's a discussion here where they mention that you, that you can have certainty about things in the universe. You can and you do have certainty that fire burns. You can and you do have certainty that food gives you health. You can and you do have certainty that when you take a knife and you press it against an apple, that it's going to slice it. And even though all of these things are contingent things and the opposite is actually possible. So uh, they uh, basically there's a, uh, what they say is that the intrinsic alternative possibilities of contingent things don't vitiate certainty. Meaning that although miracles are possible, um, we, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we have certainty that, th that they're not going to happen unless there's strong overpowering evidence that they actually have happened. And, uh, and, and the possibility of a miracle doesn't go against the fact that I'm certain that, uh, that something will actually be the case. So Again, this is something that, that we can have an entire seminar on, and it's worth investigating, very important. And he goes back and forth and he investigates this. It's something that needs to be brought into conversation with modern scientific philosophical discussions. I'm just pointing out that it's here and, uh, and they've discussed it, they've thought about it. And uh, I'll just move on because I want to walk through this section really quickly. So now we've done the first two, right? So we've done... We've done fi tari fi mutlaqil ilm, and there's many other discussions. I'm just picking and choosing to give you an idea. Fi aqsamil ilm on the kinds of knowledge. This is the third discussion of the mokif, of the mawaqif. So he says on the kinds of knowledge. So remember, knowledge here is certainty, and we are again we are looking at this in the context of this verse. Um, this verse uh, is saying that the uh, it's saying that uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is telling uh, is saying that the mushrikun should have knowledge because there's evidence and uh, and he has brings evidence that god exists that muhammad is his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they do taqlid so note first of all that their taqlid their imitation is not knowledge um, the other things the other things there's knowledge so what, what is the knowledge that the Prophet وسلم, wanted to bring? Well, put very simply, it's La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. So this, there is, uh, no one has the right to be worshipped. So the word ilah in the Arabic language, it means ma'bud, means something that's worshipped. So uh, there is nothing that is rightfully worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So these are two propositions and we want knowledge of these two propositions, evidence-based certainty. And this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was saying. So 
uh, was calling them to believe. So the Mutakallimun, they looked at this and they analyzed it with a little bit more care. And they said that there's two kinds of knowledge. There's, there's one kind of knowledge that's called conceptual knowledge. It's called tasawwur. This is now logic. Everything that I'm doing here is now the science of logic. The science of logic, it, uh, it, it is divided into two halves. It says knowledge is either conceptual knowledge or a second kind of knowledge that I'll show you. And, um, and then it, it teaches you how to arrive at these two kinds of knowledge. So conceptual knowledge is the knowledge of concepts. So when, I, when, when you say la ilaha illallah, nobody has the rights to be worshipped except Allah. What is Allah? What is the concept that comes to your mind when you say Allah? Right? So this is, so this is, there's a concept and you will find this, open up any tafsir, right? Go to Baydawi, right to the beginning, Bismillah. Look at the word Allah, they're going to give a definition. That definition, that definition comes out of the science of Kalam because Kalam is describing, it's describing one of the meanings that are there in the book of Allah. So what will they say? The classical de you, you, uh, the definition of, it's not, it's not a, it's not a um, proper definition, uh, meaning that you doesn't, doesn't give you the essence of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. That's not possible for human beings. But it'll say, it'll say that Allah is azat al-wajib al-wujud. He, al the word Allah is alam. It's a proper name. Alamun ala zat al wajib al wujud. It is a proper name for the being, the entity that exists necessarily. So when, when they say, when the scholars of tafsir, they say that the word Allah is a proper name, proper name, this is, there's a philosophy of language that's also there that, the, uh, that our scholars, they have. That doesn't come out in the science of Kalam. It comes out in the science of Usul. But uh, there's, so it's, so what is a proper name? That's something to be investigated. Um, and our scholars, they talk about it, but it's a word that, that identifies a particular thing. Okay, so it, it, ident it, it refers to a concept that only applies to one thing. So the word Allah refers to the concept that applies to the being that exists necessarily the being that exists necessarily. What are they saying? They're saying that, that you look at the universe and it's contingent, and this is evidence for this existence of this, of a necessary being. And of course, you know that evidence-based conclusion, that, that necessary being that you know exists based from, on the argument from contingency, the proper name for that necessary being is Allah. So now when you have, when you have, and you now have conceptual knowledge of Allah, you have conceptual knowledge of the concept in your mind that is referred to by the word Allah. I want you to see that if you don't have this conceptual knowledge of Allah, you cannot prove his existence you first have to understand what it is that you're proving. Then you construct an argument to prove the existence of that being. So what is the foundational concept of Allah, of God in the Quran? It's his necessary existence. Some other important things, he's a volitional agent, he's one, but his necessary existence comes first. So now, so when you have, so no one has the rights to be worshipped except Allah, you understand what Allah means is conceptual knowledge. Uh, you understand what a messenger is. This is conceptual knowledge. And they, this is a kind of knowledge. This is one kind of knowledge. The other kind of knowledge is propositional knowledge. I'm summarizing. So in this section, he'll divide knowledge into conceptual and propositional. This is an important distinction. And so now, what's propositional knowledge? Propositional knowledge is when you take concepts and you compose them into propositions that can be true or false. So you take this meaning of the word Allah, you compose it into a sentence and you say, no one has the right to be worshipped except that being that exists necessarily. And you can see why, right? Why? Because when you worship someone, you 
bow down in complete submission and you express your complete and utter neediness to that being and the only being to whom you should express your neediness is the being who fulfills all of your needs and that's only Allah and he fulfills your needs because you're in need, you're contingent and he exists necessarily. That's Allah. Nobody has the right to be worshipped except Allah. This is a rational statement. This is a rational statement that you can construct an argument for and that our scholars, they have constructed arguments for. And, and this is what the science of Kalam does. And so if you say no one has the right to be worshipped except Allah, you have conceptual knowledge of what the word Allah refers to. And then you make this, pro you make this proposition and you, and you bring evidence that it's true. You, bring, you now have pr propositional knowledge of la ilaha illallah. And someone who does not, the mutakallimun would say, if you don't understand that the universe is contingent and that this contingency reveals the existence of a necessary being who must exist, you don't understand. You don't have knowledge of la ilaha illallah. You're just, you're just saying something. You don't understand what's, you don't have knowledge of it. And this, this here, this is, it's, this is basic religious knowledge. This, this will see it's the first obligation of every Muslim, of every human being. So, you, so they divide knowledge into conceptual and propositional knowledge. And you first understand the meanings of the concepts. And then you, then you compose those concepts to understand the meaning of the proposition. And then you construct arguments to show that those propositions are true. So this is one division of knowledge, one important division. Another division that he mentions on the kinds of knowledge is the distinction between al-ilm al-daruri and al-ilm al-nadari. So al-ilm al-daruri, this is non-inferential knowledge. So I, uh, this is sometimes people, they translate this as necessary knowledge. This is a mistranslation. It's a mistranslation. What's necessary knowledge? Knowledge that is necessary to have. That's not what it's saying. Al-ilm al-daruri doesn't mean necessary knowledge. Daruri, yes, it means necessary. It means necessary in common Arabic parlance, but in the technical usage of the mutakallimun, daruri doesn't mean necessary. Daruri means non-inferential. Non-inferential is knowledge that you have without having to do inference, without having to construct an argument. And, and you have another kind of knowledge that is inferential knowledge, al-ilmun nazari. Nazar can mean to look with the eye. It can mean to look with the eye. It can also mean to reflect with the mind. And this reflection with the mind is an ancient Arabic usage. So you can go to the tafsir of in Surah Al-Ghashiyah. أَفَلَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبِلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ And you'll find a discussion there. That is, it can mean looking with the eye or it can mean reflecting with the mind. And they actually both go together. Uh, so uh, do, they, do they not reflect on the camel how it was created? And the earth and the mountains and everything else. So al-ilmun nadari. So you have two kinds of knowledge. You have in knowledge that you arrive at without any reasoning. This is knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates within us. And you have knowledge that you arrive at through reasoning. Okay, as you guys have questions, please type them in the in the QA. I'll come to them at the end. Inshallah, I'll I'll take uh, I'll take questions at the end. So these two kinds of knowledge in the next section, he talks about. Al-Isbat al-Ulum al-Daruriya on the affirmation of non-inferential knowledge. So um, uh, he says that um, uh, so on the affirmation of non-inferential knowledge. So uh, when we are um, non-inferential knowledge, so the Mutakallimun they said, if you come to this verse, right? You come to this verse. What is this verse saying in light of everything that we've seen? This verse is saying the Prophet وسلم, is coming to the polytheists and he is saying to them, use your mind. What does he mean? Use your mind. Reflect, infer, reflect on the universe, see that it's contingent, see that your idols are contingent. They're not deserving of any worship. They can't do anything. Everything depends on the necessary being. Worship that being. And there's only one of it. 
So reflect and you will come to that conclusion. So this is saying reflect, reflect. Okay, so the Mutakallimun said, you arrive at knowledge through reflection, but is all reflection or inference? Is all knowledge inferential? Is all, is to arrive, does every single kind of thing that I know have to be based on an argument? They said, no, said, no, there, there are, what happens is that there is basic knowledge that you arrive at without inference. And then you take that basic knowledge and you arrange it in a particular way to come to an inferential conclusion. This is really important. It's really important. Um, so they, you take basic knowledge and you compose it to arrive at a conclusion. So the question is, what is that basic non-inferential knowledge that you need in order to make the, in order to do kalam? Remember, when they talk about the kinds of non-inferential knowledge, their goal is a kalam goal. Maybe there's other kinds. Maybe there's not. I don't know. But what they're doing is they have in their mind what they're, they're looking at the religious beliefs that they want to prove. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. They're putting it before their eyes and they are then saying, okay, in order to arrive at those conclusions through inference, what kinds of non-inferential knowledge do I need to arrive at that? And they organized them. So they said that so this is from the this is from the mawaqif. You'll find this in books of logic, right? So this is that's also important because when the when when you read the books of logic, the books of logic, the books logic is a tool for kalam. It's used in other sciences too, but it's a tool for kalam. It's optimized for kalam. Logic is optimized for kalam. So it's a mistake to take the epistemology, the you know the all of the kinds of knowledges and to universalize them into all kinds of knowledge, all kinds of arguments. They're just concerned about this one well-defined goal and they're looking at everything that's available to them in that time. And they are saying, what do I need? What do I need in order to take me to this goal? Remember, remember when we were looking at the subject matter of the science of Kalam, when we were looking at the subject matter of the science of Kalam, just a second. Okay, when we look at the subject matter of the science of Kalam, then they say that uh, it is al-ma'loom, it's everything that is known from a particular perspective, from the perspective that you use it to establish arguments to prove the basic beliefs true, and they have a relation to this that's either close or far. So when I'm looking at non-inferential knowledge, this is the lens through which I'm looking at. This is what the mutakallimun are doing. Okay, this is what the mutakallimun are doing. And you know, one of one of the one of the reasons why the science of kalam is misunderstood by many uh, students um, is that they don't see this lens. They they think it's making absolute statements, absolute philosophical statements. It's it's uh, but it's it's this is what's happening, and it's there right at the beginning when they define the science of kalam and define its subject matter. So now, if I'm my goal is to construct arguments for uh, la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah then what are the what are the what are the basic uh, propositions he says the first are wujdaniyat wujdaniyat are the first kind of knowledge that i have um, i think this is sometimes called al ilm al huduri uh, this is al uh, wujdaniyat this is uh, like i know that i'm hungry I am hungry. I am hungry. Or I exist. Or I, so these are things that I experience within me. 
These are called wujdaniyat. Um, and he says here that this is a kind of knowledge that we have, but it's not very useful. It's not very useful for, uh, for the science of kalam because the goal of the science of kalam is to construct an argument that I can use to prove something true to someone else. But the wujdaniyat that I have, this, it's knowledge that only I possess. It's within me. It's not common. It's not shared with anybody else. He says, لِأَنَّهَا غَيْرْ مُشْتَرَكَ إِنَّهَا قَلِيلَةُ النَّفْعِ فِي الْعُلُومِ لِأَنَّهَا غَيْرْ مُشْتَرَكَ فَلَا تَقُومُ حُجَّةٌ عَلَى الْغَيْرِ And so you, they can't be used as evidence against someone else. This is why mystical knowledge, uh, knowledge the knowledge of mysticism is not... It's not, uh, you know, it's not, you can't, you can't, you, the you Mutakalimun know, will say, you, it's, you know, you could have your spiritual experience. You could have your spiritual experience. It gives you complete certainty. You have absolute certainty that God exists. You see the whole universe as depending on God. That's great. I wish I were like you. But that experience that you have, you cannot construct an argument with it because this other person who doesn't even believe in God. He doesn't have that experience. So wujdaniyat are personal experiences. And, and so, uh, so, the, so they are, so he says, these are not useful. These are not useful for the enterprise of Kalam. They're not useful for the enterprise of Kalam. He says that, uh, uh, he says the second kind is al-hissiyat. Hissiyat are the non-inferential propositions that are based on sense perception. And the most of our knowledge comes from sense perception. There are, it's only when I see the world, when I hear, when I touch and I taste that knowledge comes within me, right? So I know when I, for example, I pick something up, I look at it, I, I see that it's contingent. Therefore, God exists. If somebody is born blind and they're deaf, and they are, if they're blind and deaf, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, Allah matiana bi asma'ina wa absarina ma ahaytana. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us our hearing and our sight as long as we're alive. But if they have, if somebody is born without being able to see or hear, then the scholars of Kalam, they said that this person is not morally responsible because it's not possible for them to have knowledge. My students, I taught them this and wonderful group of high school students. And uh, so what about Helen Keller? <laughs> okay. So um, we would say that, uh, so there, that's an investigation, right? So I'll leave you in suspense. And um, uh, I can write something about that some other time, but uh, but in principle, this is this is what uh, this is how uh, uh, so hissiyat. So what are the hissiyat? The hissiyat. There's many kinds of um, knowledge, non-inferential knowledge that come from hissiyat. And in the commentary on the mawaqif, Al Jurjani he mentions these. I'll walk you through them quickly. Hey, I'll walk you, I'll, uh, I'll, I'm telling you in abstract form and then, then I'll put them together. I'll illustrate for you how they all come together in a second, inshallah. So you have something called a tajribiyat. Tajribiyat, this is knowledge that comes about as a result of experiment. Experiment is you observe and you do something you, and you repeat and you see, you observe an association between two things. And you say, for example, that fire burns that when I take a knife and I press it against an apple, it will slice the apple. The knowledge that this happens, it is, we say it's non-inferential knowledge. It's interesting because um, in science, this is not considered non-inferential knowledge. They consider the process of experiment and modeling and, all, and, uh, and uh, scientific inference. They considered a kind of inference. In the books of Kalam, it wasn't considered a kind of inference. They called it tajribiyat. And there's the third one here, it's called hadsiyat. Hadsiyat, had a lot of scientific knowledge is hads. Uh, uh, what uh, hads is when you, uh, the classic example of hads is they say that you see the phases of the moon and you know that the earth is round 
and then you put together a whole bunch of observations and then suddenly you have absolute conviction that the phases of the moon are caused by the shadow of the earth on the on the surface of the moon the sun is behind the earth so this is had you have all of these data points and you put them together you say this must be the case this is scientific inference in modern uh modern parlance this is called um inference to the best explanation ibe or it's called uh abductive reasoning okay so uh, so this is this is hadsiyat. It has the, the the scholars our ulama they talk about it very briefly. The jribiyat is when you uh, you take uh, you take uh, you observe repetition and you come to a conclusion that these two things are associated. Um, so this is what this illustrates is that when they say non-inferential knowledge, what they they have a particular meaning of inference. They mean deductive inference. There is deductive inferences, all A is B, all B is C, therefore all A is C. This is called a syllogism. We study this in logic. So the, there is a particular kind of inference that they are saying non-inferential and inferential with respect to. So you have tajribiyat and you have hadsiyat, both of these things, uh, modern scientific knowledge has developed these. And a uh, and the part of a contemporary kalam is we need to expand these sections to encompass um, modern methods of scientific inference. Um, that's a project, um, but the uh, the the base there's a basic form of it that's here. So there's tajribiyat, there's hadsiyat, there's something called mutawatirat. Mutawatirat is something that's mass transmitted. This is historical historical knowledge. So, so uh, tajribiyat, hadsiyat, mushahadat, you actually see something. You see that the door is open. Mutawatirat, uh, so hadsiyat, mushahadat, tajribiyat, all of these are based on your own observation. Mutawatirat are based on the observation of someone else. You weren't there to observe the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when they're transmitted to you in such large numbers that it's impossible for the people who, who transmitted it to have conspired to lie, then, then this gives you non-inferential certainty that this event, which returns to being a hissy thing, really happened. So they these are the uh, the kinds of non-inferential propositions related to hissiyat. Then you have something called the badihiyat. Badihiyat are um, are things that are known. Uh, uh, you know, the 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 part, the the whole is greater than the part. It's impossible for something a and non-a to be the case at the same time. The contingency of the universe is also badihi. This is important. So when I look at the universe and I see that the, that the, that the universe is contingent, I don't need to construct an argument for that. I, it's some, something that I see not without inference. So if I now uh, put all of these things together, I'll just illustrate. So these are things, I, I'm walking you through the mawaqif. There's details in the mawaqif, but uh, this, uh, you know, I'm, I, what I want to do is I want to contextualize. That's why I'm citing some verses, giving you practical examples of how, of what this really means. So what does this mean? I'll just illustrate this. So. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. I want to prove this true. So for students of Kalam, you're familiar with the basic arguments. The basic argument is for the existence of God is the argument from contingency. And then you uh, you have an argument for the uh, that Allah subhanahu wa is fa'il mukhtar, he's a volitional agent. And then you have an argument for the fact that he's one. And these there's three basic arguments for la ilaha illallah. And then there's one argument for Muhammad or Rasulullah, this is the miracle. And Dalalatul Mu'ajizah, it's un understood as divine confirmation of uh, the fact that the messenger is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a genuine messenger. There will be each of these things, um, will be, there'll be a, a session on it, a seminar on it. They'll be explained inshallah uh, there. Uh, for now, just put this in our mind. What I want to show you is how, how the, uh, uh, the conclusions that you come to, the inferences that you make in order to come to the conclusions of these two propositions, they all resolve to these non-inferential propositions that fall into one of these two 
categories. I'm going to go through this quickly, and um, if you if you've studied some kalam, then you then this will make sense. If not, inshallah, you can ask questions or you can use this as a reference. And as when you study kalam later on, it'll it'll make more sense. But uh, what's uh, what happens is that you look at the so so no one so you look at the contingency of the universe. The condition conti contingency of the universe is badihi. The fact that uh, that the universe is contingent is badihi. This is the non-inferential knowledge. Then you and this tells you that Allah subhanahu wa taala is a necessary being. Then you look at the variety in the universe. The universe is variegated. This is evidence that Allah subhanahu wa taala is a fa'il mukhtar. That he is uh, he is uh, he is a volitional agent. Because if the universe was a result of emanation, then you wouldn't have this variety. Everything would be the same. So the uh, so this variety that you see everywhere in the universe, how do you see this variety? It's mushahada. This is a something that you, it falls in the category of mushahada. So you have non-inferential propositions there that come from mushahada. Um, then when you are proving the existence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you are, uh, you are, uh, you are first, you have to know that he existed. And you know that through mutawatirat, tawatur, it's mass transmitted. He existed, the entire religion of the Arabian Peninsula changed, idolatry came to an end, the pagan, the, the Kaaba, the center of the pagan cult of ancient Arabia became a center of monotheism, never again to change the next generation, thousands of his companions all over the world, Persian empire ceased to exist, Byzantine empire on the verge of collapse, mutawatir, absolutely un, with that, beyond doubt, that the, that the Prophet وسلم, existed, taught the Quran, made these basic claims. The historical uh, uh, narrative of Islam, it is evidence. It gives you historical evidence that the Prophet وسلم, really existed and he made these claims. So you have mutawatirat and you have it's mutawatir that he taught the Quran. It's mutawatir that he, uh, that he uh, had miracles. So how do you know that something is a miracle? You know it's a miracle when it interrupts an association. How do you know that it interrupts an association? You have to know that the association is there. How do you know that the association is there? Through tajribi knowledge. Tajribi, so this is, so in order to see that something is a miracle, you do, you have, uh, you have, uh, you have knowledge through observation and, and connections between things. And there's some kinds of miracles that are known through hadz. So how do you know that the Quran is miraculously eloquent? It's hadz. It's hadz. So when you learn the science of balagha, Arabic eloquence, and you study it in the Quran, and you use it to see how beautiful it is, and you develop in your ability, and all of these things come together, and you have all of these data points, and your linguistic abilities increase, you see that this is not within the capacity of any human being to produce. Um, so now you can see that in order to prove this statement true, which is the goal of Kalam, you are taking non-inferential propositions that fall into these categories and you are arranging them, you are doing some kind of inference to come to that conclusion. And that takes us to the next section, which is on inference. So what's inference? Inference is, um, this is the table of contents on inference. So inference, this is a definition of inference. He says, "Tartib umur in ma'lumatin aw maznunatin li taaddi ila akhar." He says, "Tartib." Tartib means arrangement. So when I I take, for example, how do I prove the existence of God? I say, "The universe is." I say, uh, "The universe is contingent." The universe exists contingently. Okay, this is a amr ma'lum. Then I take another proposition. I say, "Everything." that exists contingently depends on a necessary being. The universe exists contingently. Everything that exists contingently depends on a necessary being. Therefore, the universe depends on a necessary being. This is this therefore at the end, this is a conclusion. How did I arrive at that conclusion? By taking two things that I know and arranging them in a particular way. So how, what's the proper way to arrange them? This is, this is what logic teaches you. Logic teaches you how to arrange propositions in a proper way so that it takes you to a conclusion. 
And it also teaches you how to arrange concepts in a proper way to take you to conceptual knowledge. So this is the process of inference. There's a number of things here. I'm, uh, I'm going to, there's, um, I wanted to focus in on a couple of points um, that helped, that will help um, put this science into context. So if you look here on, uh, so it says over here, uh, these, are, these are 10 maqasid, 10 subsections in Nazar. So there's 10 things that he talks about in Nazar. So the first thing, al-maqsid al-awwal fi ta'rifihi, what's the definition of Nazar? This is, this is one of many definitions that he gave. I, you know, I chose it. He said it's the best one, I think. Uh, it's a famous one. So just, but it gets the idea across. Um, then he talks about nazar being correct and incorrect and whether or not it, it, it gives knowledge. But there's this, sex, there's this discussion here. Fi kayfiyati ifadati nazar al-ilma. This is number four. Fi kayfiyati ifadati nazar al-ilma. How inference leads to knowledge. And this is interesting. It's very interesting. What they say, what is inference? Inference is tartibu umurin ma'luma. So inference is a voluntary action. So when I, when I, what do I do? I take, I take, um, when in the verse, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came to the mushrikun and he said to them, use your mind, reflect on the universe, stop worshiping idols. So uh, he, you know, he said it in a better way than I, you know, with more mercy and compassion and empathy and wild and, but, uh, Mutakallimun, they take everything, they turn, they rationalize it and make it very crude and basic. It's an important aspect of what, what, what's being said. So, uh, uh, so the basic logic of it is that, uh, that what he's saying, this universe is contingent. Do you see that? Yes, I see it. Everything. So take this fact, take the fact that everything that is contingent needs a necessary being to exist, put it together and come to this conclusion. Come to the conclusion that a necessary being exists. This inference is a voluntary action. I choose to make this inference. I choose to take these things that I know and arrange them in this way. And when I make this choice to arrange things in this way, then the conclusion comes in my mind involuntarily. So when I say, when I take, the universe exists contingently. Everything that exists contingently depends on a necessary being. And I put them in my mind that way. I find within me knowledge of the conclusion that the universe depends on a necessary being. This is an involuntary conclusion. I don't have a choice about that conclusion, but I have a choice of the inference. I have a choice about the inference. That's why over here, if you look here in As-Sadis, Ma'rifatillahi Ta'ala, he says, what uh, an al-mukallaf. What's the first obligation on every morally responsible being? What's the first obligation? And the mutakallimun, they will say that the first obligation of every human being is to think, <laughs> to infer, to reflect on evidence. That's the first obligation. The first obligation is not to believe because in order to, because belief is, what, what, what do you have to believe? You have to believe in knowledge. You have to have knowledge. Knowledge is evidence-based. How do you arrive at that knowledge? By reflection. What's the first obligation? The first obligation is to reflect, is to infer. That's, so the thing that you're responsible for is reflecting and you come to this conclusion and then you make a choice to follow it. So there's many of the mushrikun who made, who reflected, saw the conclusion, but they, but they didn't accept it. They turned away from it. So you have to, your first obligation is to infer and then to, uh, to follow the results of your conclusion. Uh, but the actual conclusion is involuntary. The, uh, the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, this knowledge is an involuntary knowledge. If you do inference, you're going to find it within you. So this is an interesting discussion. It's an interesting discussion. And this illustrates another point that 
frequently you find people, I find you know, students asking me, so they come and they look at logic and they say that, okay, um, well, I'm using logic to prove the existence of God. Does that mean that God is subject to the laws of logic? Is God subject to the laws of logic? And you know, religions that have irrational conclusions, like Christianity believes that Jesus is God. This is a contradiction. Because if you believe that God is a necessary being, Jesus is contingent. He can't be, he can't, he can't be, uh, he can't be God. This is a rational argument. The Quran makes this rational argument, by the way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that Mal Masih ibn Maryama illa rasul qad khalat min qablihi rasul wa ummuhu siddiqa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that the Messiah, son of Mary, was nothing more than a messenger. Many messengers have passed before him. And his mother was nothing more than a great saint. In other words, neither one of them is God. This is the most that they were. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives an argument. He says, They used to eat food. What does it mean they used to eat food? It means they're dependent. What does it mean they're dependent? It means they're contingent. It means they're contingent. It's a rational argument. So what a so when when you so when you look at this, then what's being said is. What, uh, what, so what, what uh, often what, uh, what a Christian will say is that, well, God is beyond, is not subject to the laws of logic. So saying that he's not subject to the laws of logic means that you can believe anything. You can, and that's, that's not, it's not, we don't accept that. We accept that God is not subject to the laws of logic. That's a true statement because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of everything. But we affirm that when we use our minds, the thing that they reveal is true. The thing that they reveal is true. So God is not subject to the laws of logic, but when we perform certain mental actions, when we, when I take these propositions and I, and I arrange them in a particular way, then we find without any choice in our minds, the contingent knowledge. We find knowledge within us that God exists and this knowledge is contingent. It's there because it was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a thing I kind of skipped. I'll, I'll just explain to you in a second. And this knowledge, it, I, it reveals to me that this knowledge and me and everything with me and my entire entirety is completely dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's how the process works. This is related to, uh, this is related to fi kayfiyati ifadati nazar al-ilma. And the and what this is saying is what what's said there is that there's three positions on on how inference leads to knowledge and the position of the ash'aris is uh, people like uh, al eg and al jurjani is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the knowledge of the conclusion in my mind when i do the inference and the inference doesn't actually bring about the knowledge on its own but it's a regular association. So when I do this, I find this knowledge and that knowledge is true. It reveals to me these facts and everything is dependent on God. And my mind reveals truth about him. So this is, and if you kind of put all of these dots together, it's, it's really, it gives you a very nice kind of a clarity on, on questions such as this. Finally, the last of the sixth section is on the means of inference. And means of inference, he talks about definition. He talks about how to construct an argument. And I'll, uh, I won't actually go through that. That's discussed in books of logic. And the, the idea here was to give a general walk through the first motif, what it's about, uh, why these things are discussed, and how to put them into context. And that's all I have for today. And it's uh, this was on Kalam, logic, and epistemology. So if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Sure. Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. So I won't say too much, but, uh, just in the interest of time, I know that there's some questions, but uh, just uh, I, will, I will add one uh, quick point, which is <clears throat> uh, mostly just from my experience for, um, you know, a big part of what we're trying to do here is um, Help to expose uh, expose other um, interested students and uh, you know uh, budding scholars 
help help to expose them to the subject matter of such an important text, which um, this you know is, is often um, I would say neglected. Quite often, people um, who seek sacred knowledge um, want to study Akita, They tend to settle for uh, a station below this. Um, that they often will sort of stop at a, a lower mid level text or a upper you know beginner text, whatever it may be. Uh, and call it a day, and that that can be fine. It's uh, there's a bare minimum that's perhaps uh, that's necessary for a person to be an imam or to be a chaplain and so on. Um, but uh, but often there's a sense that one has completed their their training when they've gone through a, a commentary on an introductory text like Johar uh, Tawhid, for example. Um, so anyway, I, so our goal here is to is to give a sense of hey, you know what what should we do next? What is what's beyond. Um, what ends up being a stopping point for 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 many, uh, especially from the West, to go uh, seeking sacred knowledge, um, and so one of the important points I, I've spent a lot of time uh, this past you know I guess maybe 14, 15 months now um, studying deeply from from books of Mantic and also from specifically the epistemology portions of Kalam texts, and uh, I would say one of the the fruits of all of this. Uh, and, you know, which derives from the, the goal, I would say, of, of laying out this material so comprehensively, um, is that this deep study and explanation of these terms and methods of a science that we're beginning with in this in, the, in, the, in this uh, prolegoma uh, pro, prolegomena of the uh, of this section, the muqaddimat of this um, of the science, um, that the the deep study and explanation and, and the question and answer and um, uh, questions and answers regard to the meanings of terms, potential objections and, and mentioning those objections. Some, sometimes people feel they, they're just getting caught in non-essentials. But if you see it through to the end, if you walk through this material to the end, um, then the, the goal I think is, is, is met uh, and the fruits are obtained, which is to have a deep clarity um, for where everything fits in its particular place. So one of these, one of the things that uh, Sheikh Hamza mentioned about the definition of a science is that a science is conceived first and foremost as a um, collective of masail, right? A collective of propositions with a question mark after it. You know, um, there's a, um, I'm forgetting the, uh, there was a nice uh, English uh, translation for it, but you know, but questions, inquiries, that's the term I'm looking for inquiries, right? Um, propositional uh, inquiries, X is Y, question mark, right? Um, that when we look at a science, it is a, it is a collective of those questions. Right? So, and, and, and they said, okay, we've got a whole bunch of questions here. There's a lot of people asking us questions about Islam, right? Uh, and then what the scholars have done is they've, they've parsed those questions out and said, well, there's a subject matter here. There's a unifying principle, a jihad al-wahda, that is connected to um, this set of questions, which leads us to the maldu uh, al the, the the subject matter of the science that distinguishes it from the subject matter of other sciences, right? So fiqh and api, or, you know, fiqh and kalam are different sciences because the subject matter is different. That fiqh is asking questions about uh, human actions, and kalam is asking questions uh, about uh, things known and believed. But there's also a min haythiya. There's also a perspective. There's a, from a particular angle. Sometimes two different sciences uh, share the same subject matter, but the angle from which they approach them uh, is different, right? So the the subject matter of medicine is the body with regard to sickness and health. But for a bodybuilder, for example, the the subject matter of their science might be the body, but from the perspective of uh, strength training, for example, right? Um, um, to use two sciences I know nothing about, um, but in any <laughs> but anyway, the the, the min haythiya, this this sort of perspective or this regard from which the the um, the subject matter is addressed um, further clarifies and and places that these masail are, are in this are in this place and these masail these inf uh, these questions uh, these inquiries are in this are, are in this pile uh, and each one of them will then have. Um, uh, an aim will have uh, a, a set of tools, methods uh, for answering these questions. Uh, so in any case, that, that deep, deep study, for example, of even just a concept like the jihad al wahda which is that unifying principle uh, that leads us uh, to the subject matter when we're talking about essential um, points, uh, and the jihad al wahda al aradiya that leads us to the aim of the science, the, the unifying principle of external uh, um, non-essential aspects uh, leads us to the aim of the science, we start to know what it is we're studying and why we're studying it, right? Which are essential questions that students ask, you know, like, why do we have to study this stuff, teach? 
right? This is the thing that we, uh, we, we hear often when we, when we get a little bit deeper. So in any case, um, what one has from this deep study is, uh, you know, e even of the muqaddimat of the, the, the sort of preliminary science or the preliminary um, uh, introductory chapters of the science is to have deep clarity of what it is we're studying, why we're studying it, how we're studying it, um, and how, how to put the pieces together so that we're not, especially in a matter as important as this, um, that we're not uh, just doing a sort of tuck lead even in the, in the, in the narration of, uh, of Kalam, which often also is a, a, a prob problematic occurrence that people study the, the, the Akli sciences as if they're Nakli sciences, that they just narrate, well, Imam Bajuri says this, Imam so-and-so says this, and that's the answer to your question without necessarily being able to demonstrate how that answer um, was arrived at and how one can arrive at similar uh, answers themselves. So Jazakumullah Khairan, those are my comments. I don't want to say anything more so that we can have some time for the, the Q&A. I'll pass the mic over Thank to you, you and take it from there, Shah. Thank you, Dr. Shirak. So the question um, is, uh, should I just go through them and one by one? Yeah, okay. So the, the first question, it, it, it says, would you, um, can you let me know whether our traditional ilmul kalam has a potential to meet the contemporary challenges or are we just discussing it as a part of our history? <laughs> so um, I think what uh, uh, I think what Dr. Spivak just said kind of illustrates the answer to this, which is that um, it's uh, any answers that we have, uh, contemporary answers that we have, if they're to be based on uh, principled thinking, then we need to build on the past. So uh, we need to understand our history. We need to understand uh, the way in which uh, you know, our scholars of the past, because they, they, uh, they went very deep and they thought about many of these issues very deeply. But the goal is that you're not studying it just as a historical artifact, but you're studying it uh, so that you can understand it and have an ability to prove these kinds of propositions true so that when there is a proposition or an argument that goes against a religious belief that you have today, you have the basic tools and the way of thinking to respond to them in a contemporary way. So, uh, uh, so it's um, uh, so we need uh, we need the history. We also need some contemporary application. Um, this is a good question. Uh, Zakius asks, he said, can we, is non-inferential knowledge the same as a priori knowledge? And um, uh, the answer to that is uh, no, it's not the same. Um, non-inferential knowledge is not the same as a priori knowledge. Um, a, so a priori knowledge, a priori, a posteriori, this is Kantian distinction. So uh, Kant, his, uh, his, he had a, his quest was for, uh, he said that a priori knowledge is all just contained within the terms and it doesn't talk about the real world. And um, a posteriori knowledge, it talks about the real world. So uh, the search is for a synthetic a priori proposition. Um, so he defined this, problem and then it's become a problem in western philosophy ever since so uh, we have synthetic a priori knowledge the and the mutakallimun they talked about it right so when i look at the universe and i see that it's contingent this knowledge is not a, a priori it's it's a posteriori when i look at the universe i look at the universe and i see that it's contingent without inference but it's not a priori it's a posteriori. A priori is before sense perception of the world. A posteriori is after sense perception of the world. So uh, non-inferential knowledge uh, is not um, a priori knowledge would be one kind of non-inferential knowledge, but there are other kinds of non-inferential knowledge that are uh, not um, a priori, uh, according to the model of the Mutakalimun. How do the late Mutakalimun deal with questions of epistemological skepticism? Imam Maturidi, for example, uses arguments of circularity to deconstruct skeptical arguments. Yeah, there is a long section uh, in, in these books, in the, in the Mawaqif. I just skipped all of it. 
and uh, epistemological skepticism. Um, they would, I don't think it would be very different from the way that, uh, uh, I don't think it would be very, very different from the way that, uh, that it's dealt with by, uh, uh, by uh, modern philosophers. Um, and so the problem with 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 somebody who who doesn't who refuses to believe in non-inferential knowledge, the problem is that you cannot that you have no common ground with them. So you basically what you do is the process is that you show that an internal inconsistency between the positions that they hold and their own philosophical skepticism. So philosophical skepticism it will ultimately um, result in their own inability to have any knowledge, even the knowledge of uh, philosophical skepticism. Um, there's other ways that they would say as well. Um, uh, it's uh, basically some, you, you illustrate to somebody that, uh, that what you are saying, you don't really believe it yourself. Could you clarify the notion of inference claimed by the scientific method in the realm of the Jiribiyat? and how it differs from the inference expressed by Ilm Nazari. So Tajribiyat. So Tajribiyat is, I, uh, I, uh, I observe that fire burns, and then I, I observe fire, I observe burning. I observe fire, I observe burning. I observe fire, I observe burning. Then I conclude that there is a relation between fire and burning. This is Tajribi knowledge. So this Tajribi knowledge that I have, it's, it's, non, it's non-inferential because what I mean by inferential knowledge is knowledge in which I make a deductive inference. So I say, I start with a proposition and I say that uh, all A is B, all B is C, therefore all A is C. This is deductive inference or, or if A then B, A therefore B, if A then B, not B, therefore not A. So this is, these are all uh, in modus polens, modus tollens. These are, uh, these are inference. So if these particular kinds of inference are not involved in arriving at a conclusion, then the mutakallimun, they'll call this non-inferential knowledge. Even though you might actually have to do, th- do something to to uh, to come to that knowledge, and so they'll in the mawaqif and the hawashi, they'll talk, they'll say that some of the non-inferential knowledge is kasbi, and some of it is ghair kasbi. Kasbi means you need to acquire it, you need to do something to acquire it. Ghair kasbi, you don't need to do anything to acquire it; it's just there within you. So when they so in their categorization of non-inferential knowledge, you have some is kasbi, some is ghair kasbi, and tajribiyat are kasbi. But also just as a comment, the main scientific knowledge is not tajribiyat. The main kind of scientific knowledge is hadsiyat. That's where real, uh, you know, uh, tajribiyat is simple, but the real advances of science, they've come through modeling, construction of models. You take all of these uh, observations, you put them together, you plug things in, you, uh, and uh, you, it's the, it's hads. Hads is the real, uh, uh, and huts, it can give you certainty, it can give you one as well. Um, Abu Muhammad asked, does non-inferential knowledge include fitra, axiomatic principles, and first-hand experiential knowledge? Yes, it includes all of them. Although fitra, I'm not sure what you mean by that. So fitra, uh, fitra technically, according to this ulama, is the capacity to know. It's the, oh, it's not the capacity to know. It is the, uh, it is, it refers to the, the fact that uh, it's the capacity for knowledge. And it's also the fact that particular conclusion, it fits with your psychological makeup. But it's not actually, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which category do prophets and messengers get knowledge of revelation fall under? It's non-inferential. Prophets and messengers, their knowledge of revelation is non-inferential knowledge. It's direct knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates within them. So they have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates within them a certainty 
that what they are receiving is knowledge from God. Um, question, does the term akli have nothing to do with the mind, but rather relates to non-inferential knowledge? Would it be correct to say that the term akli has to do with what is logical or rationally necessary, like the laws of logic, example, principle of non-contradiction, something is contradictory or not, etc.? cetera? Um, uh, so akl, the word akl is the mind. So what is the mind? So actually the mind is involved in all kinds of knowledge, whether it's inferential or non-inferential. So even when you make a uh, sense perception, when you see, for example, that, uh, that uh, you see, I look before me and I see that the wall is red, um, there is an act of the mind in seeing that the, that the wall is red. Because when I say the wall is red, this is a proposition in my mind, it has meaning. And the, the senses, they, there's something that the mind does to sense perception. So all knowledge, the akal has a role in it. Uh, even knowledge that's based on, 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 the, on the senses. Um, so uh, the, um, yeah, so I mean, we have to see the context in which akli is used and then we can, I can, I can, uh, I can give you like a, a more precise answer. Um, uh, Aida asks, how do the propositions of the social sciences like anthropology, archeology span and history fit into the definition of mawdu'a of ilm al-kalam as being al-ma'loom min haythu yata'allaku bihi isbat al-aqa'id al-ta'allukan qariban aw ba'idan. So let's take archaeology. So archaeology, it reveals information about the past. So you can dig up the uh, remains of ancient, of the civilization of ancient Egypt and you can come to a rational conclusion that the pharaoh that's mentioned in the Quran was Ramses II. I have an online lecture on this, can, Miracle of the Pharaoh in the Quran. You can, you can uh, Google it and see it. It's on the Basir channel. Um, and then you can compare what the Quran says about the pharaoh with things that we've discovered through archaeological evidence. So now uh, archaeology has now, it has a role in the historical miracle, it's miraculously accurate, unlike the Bible, which is riddled with contradictions. And there are statements that are made that the Prophet وسلم, could not have known except uh, and through revelation. So now archaeology has now, this is a relation that it holds to Ilm al-Kalam because it is now a means to establish the genuineness of the messengerhood of the Prophet This is in the positive sense. In the negative sense, you would, there might be some kind of an archaeological find that conflicts with a historical statement that's made in the Quran. And if that's the case, then it needs to be investigated and you need to show why the Quran is still true, even though archaeological evidence seems to go against it. So, uh, so archaeological evidence this is one way in which it would enter into the science of Kalam. So if you wanted to, so a modern updated science of Kalam, it would include things like carbon dating and, uh, and, uh, uh, and how to, uh, and I'm not sure, I'm not an archeological expert, but the things that archeologists do that, that enable them to know these kinds of things about the civilization of ancient Egypt. So that when you make the statement that um, Ramses II is the Pharaoh that's mentioned in the Quran, this is an evidence-based statement that you make and you can prove that it's true. So, this, so with this, archeology span would come into the science of Kalam. So the trick basically is you take a science and you look at the points of intersection. Where does it intersect with uh, with the with the goals of the science of Kalam. So um, maybe the things that you maybe like there's 
uh, previous ancient peoples in Hawaii and you dig up archaeological evidence that they used to worship God and they believed in a man called Noah who had a whose ark drowned in a flood, which I think is actually true, something like that. Um, so this is now, again, it fits with the general narrative of the Quran and this idea of Noah's flood and there it would fit in some way. But if there's some kind of an archeological finding, it says that in uh, the ancient civilization of the Amazon rainforest, people they used to, they made pottery um, with um, a different kind of clay than anywhere else in the world. This archaeological finding has no relation to anything that is in the Quran and the Sunnah establishing the truth or falsehood of religious beliefs. So this would not find its place in archaeology related to Kanan. Um, same thing with uh, with the other with the other sciences. So um, uh, uh, it would uh, it would be so. There is now uh, uh, you know so uh, why do human beings? So in anthropology, why do men? Why is the is there the institution? Why does the institution of marriage exist in human societies? So. Uh, in anthropology, there will be an explanation that's given for the existence of marriage in human societies. Um, but marriage is something that exists because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade relations between, uh, between, uh, between the sexes, uh, between, uh, between two people, uh, uh, same sex, other sex, whatever. Um, unless it's, it is marriage between a man and a woman. So now when I come to this, this fact, this now has a relation to some kind of an anthropological explanation for the reason why the science of marriage, why, why the phenomenon of marriage exists and their anthropological explanation might conflict with what, what is said here. So how do you make sense of that in the, in the light of Kalam? What and what happens when you do this is that the science itself changes as well. So the science of anthropology will change in light of Kalam. The science of archaeology will change in the light of Kalam. Because you, if you do anthropology in light of Kalam, what would it look like? It would look very different. If you did archaeology in the light of Kalam, it would look different. So what needs to happen is that first these sciences, they come into Kalam and then Kalam spills over into them and then they change. They, they, um, and that's what happened with all of, the, all of the sciences that existed in the, in the time of the, of the Mutakallimun. And that's what needs to happen now. And Kalam is the, is the, is the first step towards doing that. Um, Ron said, had siyat are among, are, are the, are from the categories of non-inferential knowledge. Hadsiyat is, is, is equivalent to objective reasoning. Then my questions are, number one, can we have probabilistic and non-probabilistic non-inferential knowledge as objective reasoning is generally assumed to be non-certain? Yes. So we have probabilistic and certain non-inferential knowledge. And so there's a kind of objective reasoning that we would hold gives you certainty, not just probability. Now, most of the scientific conclusions are probabilistic, but there's a kind of huts that happens in the context of Kalam, such as the huts that the Quran is miraculously eloquent, that gives you certainty. So, uh, so, but that's why I said that, that you have to look at these in the context of how they relate to forming the conclusions of Kalam. When you look at them in the context of doing science, they're all going to be probabilistic. That's the context in which abductive reasoning was described by Peirce um, and others. Uh, but the, uh, but in, the, uh, in the context of Kalam, there's a different use that's put to it. So it's important to see why the philosophers are defining these things. And so we, we would say that there's probabilistic and certain uh, knowledge. Does non-inferential knowledge incorporate hidden reasoning? Yes, it does. So they, there's a kind of uh, there's a kind of uh, non-inferential knowledge where they say it is in they say it is um, uh, 
they call it just that. They say um, fitriya, qiyas fitri or something. It means like the reasoning happens subconsciously, sub uh, subconsciously inferred premises. So uh, I, I presume that's what you mean. And they mentioned that. Uh, 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 Mustafa says, I'm involved in the Islamic schooling sector in Australia. I was wondering what will be the building blocks, foundational knowledge uh, needed with youth in preparation to study the uh, study Kalam. Um, uh, so I have a course I teach on the series called Why Islam is True. Um, that's where you would begin. If you're interested about that, you can maybe email me or email info at this year education. Org. So, so that's actually, I designed a course specifically to do that for, uh, for um, high school students. Um, Arafat asks, Muslim magicians have mentioned other types of knowledge as well. For example, Ilm Huduri, Qadim Muhadith, Ilm Husuli, Qadim Muhadith. Why is it absent in Al Mawakif? Um, I didn't tell you everything. I just took some snippets from here and there to construct a picture. Um, but there's a lot more that's in there. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure al Haduri Husuli is going to be there. The difference between Qadim and Hadith is also there. But I didn't, I didn't, it was, this wasn't a comprehensive um, uh, discussion of this, but it's uh, meant to motivate people to um, delve into texts like this um, in greater detail. Are the Mabade and Ashara, Sinir Zwan, of a discipline derived from the works of the peripatetic philosophers? Mm. So I'm not a, uh, so this is a question of intellectual history, right? So intellectual history is where does, where, how do the ideas flow? And this is something that, uh, uh, that you know, an academic will do. Um, and it's useful, um, but it's not my expertise. And uh, I think the training of, the, of, of a mutakallim and a traditional Muslim scholar is just to view propositions as being, uh, you look at the evidence and you evaluate whether, whether or not it's true. So Mabadi or Ashara, they are, uh, their usefulness in having, is in having this conception of the science so that you know the thing towards which you are heading and that facilitates the, uh, the acquisition of that knowledge. So in this respect, they're true, they're accurate. The way that they describe the science is accurate. What's the, uh, and the, so to, so to a mutakallim, the history of this concept is irrelevant. So al-hikmatu dalatul mu'min. So the uh, wisdom is the lost camel of the believer. Wherever he finds it, he picks it up. So. It doesn't, so is it true, is it false? That's the perspective from, this is not to say that the intellectual history is not a useful enterprise, but it's just my, uh, my I don't have, I don't have, a, uh, I don't have, a, um, I don't have, a, uh, I don't have knowledge of that. Um, okay. Um, all knowledge is created by Allah. So when we make the distinction between kasbi and non kasbi, are we looking at distinguishing between a sabab adi? Uh, yes. So if it's kasbi, it means it has a sabab. If it's non kasbi, it means it doesn't have a sabab, it's just created. So there's certain kinds of knowledge that we have that's non-kaspi. Knowledge that the whole is greater than the part is non-kaspi. But other kinds, they're kaspi. There's something, there's a sabab that you have to do in order, uh, in order for this knowledge to normally come into existence in our minds. Um, the, uh, in the video, would it be enough to say that the laws of logic are the entailments of existence rather than creations. So the disagreements amongst logicians on some things is because some are less intelligent than others and not because logic or the intellect itself is flawed. Uh, 
So I, I don't understand your question. So I don't understand where, I don't understand uh, um, the disagreements that you're referring to. But the mutakallimun would say that the laws of logic are conventional associations between uh, certain actions of the mind and uh, results that we find in our mind. And everything is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's no uh, intrinsic necessity in the contingent universe, including in our mind and our intellect. Our intellect perceives necessity, but its perception of that necessity is contingent. Uh, is the argument from contingency easier to defend than the Kalam cosmological argument because the latter is subjected to the challenge of actual and potential infinity? I'll talk about this, inshallah, in the uh, section uh, in Mokif number five. So I'm going to do beliefs about God. So inshallah, let's, 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 uh, let's uh, take it there. But in brief, um, the Muzikalimun would say that the Kalam cosmological argument returns to the argument from contingency. It's based on it. Um, and so the uh, contingency is more fundamental. This is one position, which I think is the strongest one. The uh, final question, what would be your advice for someone who is seeking to come to a mastery of Kalam in the West? Would you suggest studying Kalam at the academic level? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I, I think, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, the, in order to understand Kalam, you have to study it with somebody who is, who does Kalam uh, um, and sees it for what it is, namely that it's something that proves the foundational beliefs of Islam true. And because the purpose of studying Kalam is to acquire that ability yourself. So uh, a tra in, from the traditional Muslim uh, scholarly perspective, you would have to find somebody who has that ability. And then you use the books of Kalam, you study them with that person so that there's an ability transfer. Um, uh, most, um, you know, it's not, um, most academic studies, that's not what they focus on. They focus on developing a competency in the basic uh, questions and vocabulary based on supervised research. Um, and that can be useful uh, if you find a good supervisor, but it can also be, um, it can also be misleading if, uh, if it's interpreted in, in, a, in a way that is uh, divorced from its uh, original religious context. Yeah. Any questions? Anything else? So, so there's a question, will a recording of this talk be available? Yes, inshallah. And uh, uh, you'll receive, so if, all of you will inshallah receive an email when it goes up. So we will stop here. Uh, thank you all for attending. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.